Well, we are in hour 23 of Learn the Bible in 24 Hours, and in which we will attempt to go from Revelation chapter 4 to the end of the book, chapter 22. And uh, you may recall that Revelation is one of the unique books that gives you the outline of the book. And uh, in verse 19 of chapter 1, John is told to write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta, hereafter, or after these things. And uh, there, it's past, present, and future tense in effect. What he has seen, and what's past at this point in chapter, in, uh, by verse 19 of chapter 1, is the vision of Christ. And every little label, every detail in that vision is used then as an identity somewhere later in the book. And some of the identities are very obvious, some are very subtle. Then he says, write the things which are, that actually exist now. And that's, the, that's obviously the seven churches. So this will be chapters 2 and 3 are seven letters penned by Jesus Christ to seven churches. When we count epistles, we often say there's 21 epistles. 14 ascribed to John and seven others. And uh, no, there's actually another seven that often get overlooked. And that's the, the ones by Jesus himself in chapters 2 and 3. Probably the richest material in the entire book. But at this point... We're going to see what shall be hereafter, what follows after the churches. And the word hereafter in the Greek is metatauta. And uh, because I've taught this way for many years, there's a society in Utah called the Metatauta Society, which basically hosts a, a national speaker once a month. But the, the guy that organized that uh, picked this up from these presentations, actually. But in any case... So when you get to chapter 4, verse 1, not surprisingly, the first words you're greeted with in the Greek is metatauta, after these things. It's translated after this in your English translation. So John continues saying, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be what? Metatauta, after these things. Oh, and another point that comes up in verse 5 of chapter 4. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. Jesus identified those seven lamps in chapter 1. What were they? The churches. Where are they in chapter 4? In heaven. That's significant. We're not, these subtleties are the kinds of things I want to tune you to. And don't, again, I want to remind you, put Acts 17.11 at the top of your notepad. Acts 17.11 is where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. Receive, an, receive with openness of mind, but search the Scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. So we're entering, in chapter 4, we're actually entering the throne room of the universe. We actually have a vision of the throne of God in, in, uh, in the first couple of, uh, second and third verses. And by the way, the throne of God, you see that in Isaiah 6. You'll see it in Ezekiel 1 and 10. It's, uh, it, these are major passages that you can read and compare. And uh, you'll see the things that are consistent. You also notice some subtle things that are different. And in those, there's great lessons. But we also find ourselves confronted here in chapter 4 with 24 elders. 24 elders. And... Uh, We'll discover as we get into the chapter 5 that they will identify themselves as kings and priests, and I'm going to suggest to you that they represent uh, the redeemed. And that may sound like a strange representation. Some people say, well, gee, there's 12, 24 elders, 12 apostles, and 12 patriarchs. I don't think it has anything to do with that. I think it has, the only place 24 appears in the Bible is when David organizes the priesthood. The Levitical priests were organized into 24 what, what, what's translated courses. And each course officiated the temple for one week. And on Shabbat, they shifted to the next one. And they cycled that way. And uh, it's sort of like a watch bill in the Navy, in a sense. Except if you were a priest, you were, you were the course of so-and-so. There's 24 of those. The course that you were in is the one that you always served with throughout the year. And... Uh, you would serve every 24 weeks, in effect. Once every 24 weeks, in, that, in a formal sense. And certain holidays had them all. But in any case, we also find in Revelation 4 the seven lamps burning. And I'm going to suggest to you they are the same lamps that Jesus identified in chapter 1 as the churches. What's interesting is we also encounter in the description of the throne room of the universe 
a sea of glass that the elders are standing on. And I think this is kind of interesting because the whole throne room of the universe is modeled by the tabernacle in many ways, and I won't go through all that here, but it's interesting, the, the correlative part of that in the tabernacle was the molten sea, this huge laver that they bathed in. Molten sea is a clumsy translation of brass wash basin. Large, it was, you know, it was, it was uh, uh, five cubits deep, seven and a half uh, feet deep. So it was deep, that they actually could immerse and, and, and they have their ritual uh, washing there. And so it's interesting... In the tabernacle, it represented the Word of God. Now you're clean by the washing of the Word. Ephesians uses that expression. But here the elders are standing on it. They're standing on the Word of God. Right here, you and I, we wash in it. There, we'll stand on it. And you say, Chuck, that's a pun. Yes, it is. It's a figure of speech, and it's interesting, the consistency. But in any case, we also encounter... Whenever we, see, whenever we see the throne of God, we always seem to encounter these four living creatures. Some unfortunate translations label that beasts, and that caused them to get confused with chapter uh, 13 of Revelation. It's a different Greek word. In the Zoa, it's, it's the, it, they're living creatures. These are the cherubim. They're probably similar to or maybe the same as the creatures in Isaiah 6, which he calls seraphim. But they are characterized by a number of things. They have wings and so on, but they have four faces. The lion, the calf, the man, and the eagle. And we felt that was very significant, both in terms of the camp of Israel and its four, the four camps that make up uh, three, you know, three tribes each. Uh, we looked in Numbers too, and the, also they're idiomatic of the four Gospels, interestingly enough. But the 24 elders, I believe, are uh, foreshadowed in the sense by David's 24 courses. In 1 Chronicles 24, you can check that out. It shocks many Bible students to discover there are other priesthoods besides the Levitical priesthood that is so prominent, of course, in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus and all through the, the history of Israel. The priesthood was separate from the ruling line. The ruling uh, tribe was Judah. The priesthood was Levi, and they were not to cross. It's interesting, though, if you study your Bible carefully... The most prominent non-Levitical priest is Melchizedek. He shows up, incidentally, in Genesis 14, and he would disappear into oblivion if it wasn't for Psalm 110 and about three chapters of the book of Hebrews, where they emphasize that Jesus Christ is a priest and a king after the order of, or in the fashion of, in a sense, of Melchizedek, who is both a king and a priest. What many people don't notice is that Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, was a priest of Midian. He wasn't a Levitical priest, but he was a priest. And uh, Jacob also gives tithes in Genesis 28. To whom? It's long before, long before uh, any of these. It could be related to Melchizedek. It might be something else. And those are, uh, you know, uh, perceptions. So be aware of that. But the main point is, there are only three people in the Scripture that are king and a priest. Melchizedek, and the, Hebrews five, the writer of Hebrews 5, 6, and 7 hammers away that Jesus is unique in that he's a king and a priest, non, non-Levitical. And there's a third category, that is, and that's us. The 24 elders are kings and priests, as we'll see. When you get to chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, it says, they, sang, they sung a new song that the elders are singing, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Now what's interesting, I'll just summarize it now, but you'll follow as we go. The tribulation doesn't start until the Lamb starts opening the seals of the book. He doesn't receive the book to open it until after the 24 elders have put their crowns on the glassy sea. The main point is the elders are up there, worshiping Christ before the tribulation starts. Very interesting, and it's consistent with a number of other passages, obviously. Notice how often it's us when we. Something I should point out to you, that uh, we know that the elders are not angels, because of chapter 7 and verse 11, it makes it clear they're distinct from angels. They identify themselves here by saying, thou hast redeemed us, they're saying. Thou hast made us uh, and we shall reign on the earth. These, this is the expectation of the elders. And uh, 
Uh, it's obviously... Uh, there, there, now, there are some that say, gee, there's some manuscript, you'll hear some Bible footnotes will say, but there's some manuscripts makes that third party, that, you know, thou hast redeemed them and so forth. That's misleading. Only one manuscript out of 24 renders it that way. Clearly the abundance of the scriptural evidence is exactly the way it's been translated. And that's why it's been translated that way in our Bible. But we get to chapter 5, we have this pivotal event. An event that you really won't understand if you haven't studied the book of Ruth. To understand what a kinsman redeemer is. But uh, let's jump in. John says, And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the backside. Sealed with seven seals. When it's written on the backside, that wasn't normally done, but it was done with title deeds. Because on the backside was written the requirements it took to open it. If you were going to redeem it, the requirements to redeem it were spelled out on the outside. And if you were qualified, then you could uh, open it and, and uh, claim it. So this is a scroll written within and on the backside, and it was sealed with seven seals. Not one seal, seven of them. So you break one and you can unroll it part way. You break another one, you can roll it. It's, it's sequential in that sense. Remember, it's, a, it's not like a book we think of. It was a, not a codex. What we, call a, what we call a book would be formally called a codex. They were starting to emerge in the first century. But this is in, a, in the Old Testament idiom in a sense. And uh, it's a scroll a, a, as, as you would visualize it. John continues, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? to open the scroll, and to loose the seals thereof. And no man, notice that, no man. We're talking about a man here. Had to be a kinsman of Adam. Adam forfeited it. If you're going to redeem it, you have to be a kinsman. No man in heaven or in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look upon it. And uh, you and I might not fully understand this, but John did. Because in verse 4, John says, I sobbed convulsively. He really, he didn't sniffle, he really, he wept much is the way it's translated typically. Because no man was found worthy to open and read, this, uh, to read the scroll, neither look thereon. This is a huge tragedy. This is a cosmic tragedy if it was left undone. At this point though, it's a huge cloud on the proceedings. But fortunately, one of the elders said unto me, John says, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. I want you to notice one of his qualifications to do that wasn't just that he was God and he was perfect. He also was man. Part of his mission was to become man to be qualified to redeem that which man had forfeited. John continues, And, and I beheld, and lo, in other words, I visualize the elder telling him he's going to be, look, the lion of the tribe of Judah has is, 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 is prevailed. And as John turns, he doesn't see a lion. These are idioms of title. These aren't visual. You know, it's not a, a lion with mane. It's a, a title of Christ. But as he turns, as I, as I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood the lamb as it had been slain. And this isn't a four-footed lamb as you sometimes see artists rendering it. This is a title of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist introduced him publicly when he first introduced him. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's the way John the Baptist introduced his first appearance publicly. So the lamb as, not a lamb by the way, the lamb as it has been slain, having seven hordes and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. It's interesting to, see, interesting to me to see where the Lamb is. He is in the midst of the elders. That's precious. That's precious. The Lion of the tribe of Judah, also the Lamb as it had been slain. And I saw the Lamb opened. One of this, now, we're gonna, now this is going to start a sequence of seven seals. This, the book's got seven seals. We're going to open them one by one. John says, I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder... And one of the four beasts, that one of these four cherubim, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth, conquering and to conquer. You know, it's interesting how many expositors will publish a book. And because he's riding a white horse, they think he's a good guy. And they try to identify him with Jesus Christ. 
And if this is Jesus Christ, we got a problem because he's in bad company. The other horsemen are pretty grim, as you'll see. No, just because he's a white horse, it's interesting that he is a poser. He is a phony. He is the false Christ. And it's, he's, he does such a good job of it, he misleads many commentators. He, he that sat on him had a bow. The word bow in uh, Tekon, in the Greek, is uh, uh, in, in the book of Genesis, God gave Noah a bow, a rainbow in that case. It was a token of a covenant. And I believe the word bow here is also a token of a covenant. It's the covenant that defines the 70th week of Daniel. But let's go on. And a crown was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. And uh, if that's all we knew, it'd be ambiguous, but let's go see what happens next. So we have the first seal, a white horseman going forth to conquer. We're going to have four. The first four seals are the famed four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first one's riding a white horse. When he'd opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And so we have the red horsemen, which represent wars. So conquering and going forth wars. These are turbulent times, obviously, going forth here. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, a lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. The term, the, the denarius here that's translated is, was a day's wage. And one measure of wheat, a measure, you, know, when you get one meal for a day's wage, you get, you get it, it, the less expensive grain, you can get three. But you, you, all luxuries are out of the question. This seems to be, in the minds of most analysts, an idiomatic way of describing inflation and famine. It may shock you to discover that most famines in the history of the world are, there, are due to political maneuvering, not a shortage of resources. That's a very cynical, disturbing discovery, but uh, it, it's, it, uh, there are scholars that will support that. So we have conquest, wars, famine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. The word pale is, the word is in the Greek is actually chloros. It's a gr pale green. Um, behold, a chloros horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell, or Hades, followed with him. Let me comment quickly here. I think most of you should be recognized that in the Hebrew it's called Sheol. In the Greek it's called Hades. It's not hell as we think of hell. It's the, it's this, it's the, the domain of the departed souls. Not the, it's not the grave. The grave's the body. Graves can be owned by people, have a name on it. No, no one owns Sheol or Hades. And Hades has two compartments. The good guys and the bad guys. That's all out of Luke 16. You can study it. When you see hell, often in the English Bible, it really should be, it's really translated, it's a translation of either the Sheol of the Hebrew in the Old Testament or the Hades of the Greek. And Hades will be cast into hell uh, at the end of the book of Revelation. Hades and Sheol are temporary reservoirs. Um, and uh, they're, the, the, the idioms are geocentric. Uh, the Gehenna or the thing that we think of as hell, is just the opposite. It's in the outer darkness. Anyway, uh, death and Hades followed with them, and power was given unto them, over them, see it's plural, it's all four of these characters, over a fourth part of the earth, a fourth part of the earth, to kill with a sword, with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And the word beast there, by the way, don't jump to the conclusion you're talking about four-footed mammals. Those beasts might be microscopic. This could, this could include, in its overview, pestilence, uh, disease of different kinds. So we have the fourth. So these four, white, red, black, and green, are the fabled four horsemen. In literature, th these four horses, when they're riding, are idiomatic of wars and, and dark times. 
Uh, there have been many novels and, and fiction items that uh, uh, lean on the four horsemen of the apocalypse as idiomatic of just trouble, turbulence, death, uh, conquer, conquering, going forth, wars, famine, death, and so forth as a group. And uh, to try to identify the white horseman as Christ will just call, give you confusion trying to make sense of the rest of it. Let's move on. When he'd opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. That's interesting. Because these martyrs must have been resurrected to wear robes. And it was said unto them that they, should, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So that's the, the, the martyrs is, is this, the fifth seal. And I beheld when he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island was, were moved out of their places. It's fascinating to me that there are scholars that try to argue the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled. I don't think so. Not so you'd notice. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the what? The wrath of the Lamb. I want you to notice that this trouble is more than just persecution. It is the wrath, not of Satan, there are those that paint that picture in their books that they write. No. The wrath is whose? Jesus. The wrath of the Lamb. I want you to notice this occurs all through the book, but it's showing up here in chapter 6 at the front end of all these things. It isn't something left to the very end. Follow me? And who shall be able to stand? Now those of you who are paying attention when we went through Joshua, remember that's what did the enemies of Joshua do? They tried to hid in the, hide in the caves, rocks fall on us and so forth. There's a, there's a parallel. The book of Joshua and the book of Revelation have the same outline. It's very worth your, worth your comparison, comparative study. So we have these cosmic changes I'll, I'll just summarize it with. Now then I want you to know something else. This is a pattern in the book. When there's seven things, you'll notice there'll be six things and then a break. A parenthesis. As the subject seems to change, they talk about something else for a while, and then they give you the, the seventh one. It's always six, a break, and the seventh. And in this case, we have, after chapter six, the trumpets uh, that are going to follow, they don't start until chapter eight. Chapter seven is sort of like an insert, or like, a, like catching your breath. These things are building up. And it's, as if, it's almost as if the... the uh, uh, the, the, the screen director gives you a, a chance to catch your breath and talk about something else for a moment. So what comes in here is the, in ch chapter 7 is the ceiling of the 144,000. What is listed there are the 12 tribes. And uh, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes make up this peculiar special number of 144,000. And I think it's 144,000. Because that's what it says. And as if to emphasize that, the Holy Spirit says there's 12,000 from Judah, 12,000 from... He goes through the, 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 the tribes. So when somebody rings your doorbell and claims they're one of the 144,000, ask him what tribe he's from. There are... Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not to disparage uh, some of these other cults and things, but, but uh, there's a real fixation by some on the hundred, being one of the 144,000. The 144,000 are clearly Jewish, and they're sealed after the rapture. There are two tribes missing. I thought there's 12 tribes. Well, there's 12 tribes here, aren't there? Name one of the tribes that's missing. Ephraim. Good. That's good. Many people miss that. Ephraim's there, but it's in disguise. You see, you've got Joseph in here, but by the time you get to Joseph, you've already mentioned Manasseh. The tribe of Joseph consists of Manasseh and Ephraim. Well, Manasseh's listed. 
So what's left is Ephraim, but it's called the tribe of Joseph. It's as if the Holy Spirit's giving him the back of his hand. He's there, but not by his personal name. You follow me? But there's somebody else even more conspicuous that's totally missing. Tribe of Dan. And this is legend. People have speculated about this way back, even in the Old Testament period, strangely enough. As you study the tribe of Dan throughout the Scripture, you'll notice that the more you study him, the stranger that tribe is. And so we're going to wonder, where's the tribe of Dan? Where's Ephraim? Well, Ephraim I've mentioned. Why is Dan not here? Well, the, the general consensus by theologians is it's the tribe through which idolatry entered the land. The golden calf up north and all of that. Jacob in Genesis 49 prophesies over each of the 12 tribes. And when he talks about Dan, he, calls, he alludes to him as a serpent. And uh, that's, uh, in, in uh, Levitical idioms, that's uh, pretty disparaging. And so the tribe of Dan has as its symbol a, uh, a serpent with an e uh, e uh, eagle with a serpent in its mouth. And uh, Ahizer, the head of the tribe of Dan during the period, time of the Exodus, didn't like the serpent, so he had an eagle with the serpent, and that later becomes the symbol of the tribe is simply the serpent, uh, uh, simply the eagle without the serpent. But um, Moses also, just like Jacob did in Genesis 49, Moses in Deuteronomy 33 also closes his book by prophesying over each of the 12 tribes. And when he talks about Dan, he makes a strange remark. He says, he shall leap from Bashan. Bashan is what you and I would call the Golan Heights, up north. What makes that prophecy rather strange, after Moses, of course, Joshua takes over, when they conquer the land, they finally, after seven years, they, they succeed. And then the land is allocated among the tribes. And the allocation of Dan was west of Benjamin. That is, visualize it between Jerusalem and the coast. And they can't cut it there. Their big hero was Samson, who did a lot, he made a lot of colorful pranks on the Philistines, which are the adversaries there, uh, but he didn't really accomplish much. And when he dies, they can't hold the turf. So they send a, 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 a military group up north. They find a, a town called Laish, which they capture and take over, and they move up north. So during the history of Israel, they say from Dan to Beersheba, is the way we would say from Maine to California. In other words, Dan up north to Beersheba down in the extreme south. But that wasn't where they were allocated. And yet it's so fascinating to look back and see that Moses predicted that they would leap from Bashan. Because they not only went up there, they then leave from there. And strangely enough, uh, they left. when you get to uh, Judges 18, Deborah and Barak had this huge uh, victory over Sisera, and she compliments the tribes that helped, and she disparages the tribes that didn't help. And about Dan... She says, he wouldn't even leave his ships. His ships? What's he doing in ships? So we get the impression that Dan sought their future separate from the commonwealth of Israel very, very early, even in the days of Exodus and on. And uh, so uh, uh, it's interesting that uh, something that may shock many uh, uh, historians is to discover that Spartan, Sparta and Troy were Jewish. Uh, you can find letters from um, in, the, in the book of Maccabees between the high priest and the king of Sparta uh, acknowledging uh, their common ancestry. So uh, it's very, there, there's a whole side here to study. But uh, Deborah's indictment gives, you, gives a hint there's far more going on here. And, and so Dan is in any case, for whatever reason, you'll also discover throughout the, the, the uh, text that uh, where, there's ge where they go through, like in First Chronicles, they give the chronologies, uh, the, uh, the genealogies, excuse me, the genealogies of each of the tribes, they, don't, they skip Dan. The Holy Spirit seems to have something against Dan from, from the get-go. And so he's admitted from the genealogies, and of course he's not sealed in, uh, during the tribulation, which is what Revelation 7 is all about. Okay, so we have this parenth parenthetical topic, chapter 7, and then we get to the seventh seal. It picks up in chapter 8, verse 1. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. This leads to the speculation that there's no attorneys in heaven um, or politicians. But uh, that's, of course, being flippant. Um, but it's interesting, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And it's interesting that he studied, again, studied Jericho and the seven times they marched around the city, they keep silent. 
And the seventh time, they do it seven times, and then they shout, and the walls come up. But you notice the, the patterning is very deliberate. Then anyway, he goes on, and I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. We've been through seven seals. Now we're going to go through seven trumpets. And uh, so the seventh seal is silence in preparation for the seven trumpets. The seven angels, which the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound, and the first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth. And a third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. Some scholars try to make those symbols. Some of them take them very literally. It's your choice as you get more familiar with the, with the thing. That's the first trumpet. The second trumpet, the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And a third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea had li and had life died. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. Now people have different few views as to what these visions and symbols mean. But I can tell you after 50 years of study, as every time I go through it, every time I think I've learned a little bit more, it's always nudged me in the direction of taking it more literally than before. So that doesn't mean I'm right, but I can tell you I, I have come more and more to believe that God means what He says and says what He means within the, within the framework of, uh, of figures of speech. But uh, uh, I think that when you see Him, when you've got a th creatures in the sea that died because of this and a third part of the ships are destroyed, I tend to think that that's real water and real ships and real oceans, but that's just my view. Um, there are good scholars with different views. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So we have uh, three trumpets, and uh, we go to the fourth. The fourth angel sounded. And a third part of the sun was smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars. So as, as a third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So we have the fourth, the darkness, a third of the sun and stars. And I, heard, and I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, get this, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. In the vernacular, I'd say, you haven't seen anything yet. The next three are real doozers. The inhabitants of the earth. You'll notice all through the book of Revelation, you have the earth dwellers. They're the losers. The term is used of those that are going to experience this judgment. You're going to see, God isn't through. There are people that get saved and so forth after the rapture. Many. And, uh, but it's, uh, understand that the, the earth dwellers are the inhabitants of the earth. Um, I don't believe that means everybody that happens to be here. I think it's the people who inhabit the earth. That's their focus. That's their dwelling. That's their commitment. In contrast to us who are pilgrims passing through. But uh, anyway, this is the warning of what the so-called, the last three trumpets are called three woes. So we got three woes coming here. The fifth angel uh, sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth, and to him was given the key to the abuso, the bottomless pit. Now, there's only one place that a pit can be bottomless. Think about it. Where is the only place you can have a pit that has no bottom? Let me ask you another kind of a question. Suppose I had a house, and each side of the house faced south. And I looked out the window and saw a bear. What color would the bear be? Hmm? White. Good. Because the only place I can have a house with four sides, all, all of which are south, is at the pole. Using that same logic, where's the only place you can have a bottomless pit? The center of the earth. The center of the earth, all directions are up. So I'm, I'm one of these crazies that I really think the abuso is geocentric. At least it is certainly as idiomatically. And uh, it's interesting to me that Hades and Sheol and abuso are all geocentric terms when the Gehenna is in the outer darkness. Just a thought. Anyway, Go moving on. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. 
And unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, are these real locusts? I don't think so, and I'll show you why. These are idiomatic locusts, and I'll show you why. In Revelation 9, it goes on for many, many verses describing these creatures. And they are strange creatures. The, and it goes on, they had tails like scorpions, and they had stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them. Aha, there's a clue. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Both mean destroyer. Just. Proverbs 30, verse 27, tells us that the locusts have no king. It happens to make that remark, but I think the Holy Spirit put it in there to help us unravel this. These locusts have a king. So are they locusts? Not, not in the natural sense. The, those are idioms for some kind of demon creatures. Because these have a king. And that's kind of interesting because if you study Amos chapter 7 verse 1 in the Septuagint, you'll discover that there is a very big difference in the Masoretic, the Hebrew, and the Greek translation three centuries before Christ of that particular verse. The law, the, the cut right through it, is that the name of the king of the locusts, his name is Gog. Gog and Magog. Gog is a title. It's a demonic title. Magog is a people. Anyway, moving on. This is, uh, at this point though, one woe is past, and behold, there come two Two woes more hereafter. So we have the so we have now the first of the woes there. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And that's idiomatic, of course, of the golden altar in the tabernacle. Saying to the sixth angel which had a trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. This is a strange passage because it seems to underscore the fact that demon, demons, demon hosts, are geographically bounded. What on earth, if the fact that there's these demon creatures, fine, what does it got to do with the river Euphrates? Big, the river Euphrates will show up several times in the book of Revelation. The, the river Euphrates was the eastern boundary of the Roman Empire. But it seems to have a, it, it, it's, it's very strange because there's major negotiations going on between Israel and Turkey over the water rights and so forth. The water is more precious in the Middle East than, than oil in some respects. You can't drink oil. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone or of wood, which can neither see or hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. One of the cloudy, gloomy aspects of the book of Revelation, nowhere in the book is their repentance. As these things come and they get worse and worse and worse, people still don't repent and acknowledge God. Very dismal forecast. Okay, so we've got these six trumpets. Now again... We, are at, we would expect a parenthesis, and there's a substantial parenthesis here of a handful of chapters, four chapters. We have chapters 10 through 14. And chapter 10 is, has a strange episode. The mighty angel comes down with a book and has uh, asked John to digest it. In chapter 11, you have this interesting episode of these two witnesses. And then you have uh, chapter 12. is an interesting chapter. It's a summary of the history of Israel. And then chapter 13 introduces us to these two beasts that we collectively call the Antichrist. Remember, there's two guys, a political leader and a religious leader. We'll see them in these two beasts of chapter 13. And chapter 14 is sort of an echo of chapter 7. We had those 12, tri the 12 tribes, the 144,000 sealed. The fruits of their preaching will show up in chapter 14. So we have this interesting parenthesis. And the second woe is passed. Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell down, excuse me, fell upon their faces and worshiped God. And so the seventh trumpet is a declaration that the mystery of God is finished. Well, that's pretty exciting. Let's take a look at these, this parenthetical passage. See, the seventh trumpet ushers in, will usher in. When you, get, when you get to it, the seven bowls that are coming. We had seals, trumpets, then bowls. The bowls that were coming. This mighty angel that shows up in chapter 10, he has a book that's un, it's now unsealed. He tells John to digest it. 
It also is written within on the backside. Many scholars feel that the book he's talking about is just the book we've just seen open. It also says, thou must prophesy again. Some people feel that, well, it's turned over, it's a repeat, or it's an overlay. There's different views on that part of it. Then we have this peculiar passage of the seven thunders uttering their voices. Seven thunders utter their voice, and John is about to write what they said when he is instructed, don't write it. So he crosses it out. He removes it. And it's puzzling. Why on earth did he even mention it then? And uh, I have a theory. I think, the seventh, I think the Word of God will not be complete until those seven thunders utter and are recorded. Any Bible doctrine that's built on the premise that there is the, 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 the canon is complete is thus a frail. I don't think there's anything else missing other than the seven thunders. Don't misunderstand me. But there are people who try to make an argument that the gifts of the Spirit were only until the canon was complete. The gifts of the Spirit didn't end. You can't find a biblical basis for saying they ended. There are lots of different gifts. There's a whole study. We went through that with second, when we were in uh, first, Chronicles, uh, first uh, Corinthians 12, 13, 14. But I think this, what's interesting about the seven thunders, if nothing else, is that it puts to silence any attempt to make a doctrine that the canon is complete. But uh, that's the speculation. Let's go on. In chapter 11, we have the temple featured in the first two verses. And uh, because of that, uh, this, is a good, this would be a good place to insert background on the temple, except we covered that pretty well last time. I'll, I'll let it go. Jesus, Paul, and John all make reference to the fact that the temple will be standing. Jesus does in Matthew 24, very key, the key to end time prophecy. Paul alluded to it in 2 Thessalonians that we looked at last time, and that's why we went into it last time, although it shows up here in Revelation in the first two verses of chapter 11. The temple is standing. But the rest of that chapter deals with these two characters that show up. The temple's measured, as I indicated. The outer court is given to the Gentiles for 42 months. That's the first half of the, or the last half of the, the uh, 70 week of Daniel. The, uh, these two witnesses show up, and they're empowered for 1260 days. The, the, again, we have the 42 months, 12, these are the half weeks, if you will, of Daniel's 70 weeks. They, they, they can do four different, together they can do four different things. They, they can call down fire from heaven. One, they can shut down, shut heaven so there will be no rain. They can turn water into blood. And they can smite the earth with plagues. It's for that reason that I'm among those that believe that these two witnesses are literally uh, the two guys that had those four powers. I'll come back to that in a minute. Elijah and Moses. Elijah called, called down fire from heaven. He's the only one that did that I can find. Uh, remember at Carmel? He also shut heaven down for no rain. And what's fascinating about that to me, you won't find this recorded in the Old Testament, but you'll find allusions to it in the New Testament that how long did he shut down heaven for no rain? Three and a half years. I think that's interesting. And of course Moses turned water into blood and smit the earth with plagues. So these, uh, these, these particular powers that are listed there are indicative of Elijah and Moses. And both Elijah and Moses had their ministries interrupted. So you can make, you can, there's a whole study you can get into. Other people have different views, but uh, for what it's worth. Uh, what's interesting about this is that they will, when they're through ministering, they will be killed by the Antichrist. And this is the only celebration that occurs on the earth in the book of Revelation. When they're finally killed, the world exchanges gifts, thrilled that these troublemakers are finally killed. And they, the bodies lay in the street for three and a half days. I assume it's featured on television. Then the big scene occurs as they're resurrected and taken up to heaven. I can just imagine CNN covering that right now. I can just visualize that. But uh, that clearly is uh, tough stuff. Chapter 12 is a fascinating summary of the history of Israel in, in idioms. There's a woman identified with the sun and the moon and 12 stars, and she's with child. The first thing you need to understand is who is the woman? Some people try to make her the church, and as Chuck Smith likes to point out, if the woman is the church, she's in big trouble because she's pregnant. Church is supposed to be the virgin bride. No, the sun and the moon and the stars is an identity that no, none other than Jacob himself identifies her with. 
in Je- back there in Genesis 37. Um, the beginning of the, st- the whole story, Genesis 38, the whole uh, story of Joseph and his dreams and so forth. Uh, Jacob had recognized the identity. She is a, uh, uh, opposed by the red dragon who is identified in verse 9 of chapter 12 as Satan. He has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns, which are, of course, idiomatically all through the book of Revelation. Her, his goal is to devour the man-child as, as soon as he's born. And, uh, but he, the man-child is, is the one that's going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Who is that? Jesus Christ, so identified in several passages in the Scripture. He's caught up to God in His throne. And the woman flees into the wilderness for 1260 days. Now what's kind of interesting about this, most people assume that when the man-child is caught up to God in His throne, that that's the ascension of Christ. And that may well be what's in view. But I think it was G.H. Pember uh, back in 1814 that first noticed the possibility that may be an allusion to the rapture. Because the body of Christ is caught up. In other words, idiomatically speaking, they, those are lumped together. So we're in this parenthesis between the, church, uh, the church's birth and the church's rapture. So there's the, there are those views embedded in the, in the uh, passage here. The, word, the woman, I believe, is Israel because of Genesis 37, verse 10. The red dragon is serpent, uh, the devil is Satan, so in Revelation 12, 9. The man-child is none other than the kinsman redeemer, as will be exemplified in Revelation 19 when we get there. And so that's pretty clear. Satan has been trying to devour the man-child, or certainly thwart, his, thwart the plan of God. We reviewed that during our study, but the corruption of Adam's line back in Genesis 6, uh, the, the attack on Abraham's seed in Genesis 12 and 20, the famine in the earth in Genesis 50, the destruction of the male line by the pharaohs in Exodus 1, Pharaoh's pursuit of Israel even after saying they could go in Exodus 14. The 400 years that Satan had to lay down a minefield in Canaan with the Rephaim and, and the populating of the, with this, again, with more Nephilim and all of that. And then as God reveals his plan that's going to be through David, then David's line gets singled out for special treatment. Jerome killed, again and again and again, there are plots to kill all the heirs to the throne, but there's always one that slips away or is uh, hidden by a servant or what have you. And... Uh, so, uh, and even when you get to the Persian period under Haman, un- under uh, uh, the Persian Empire, Haman tries to wipe out all the Jews. So these are always satanic. Prejudice is always bad, but the anti-Semitism is very specifically satanic. It, from Revelation chapter 12, becomes, it becomes very clear. And it, and it occurs, it continues in the New Testament. Joseph's fear with Mary when she turns out to be pregnant. Herod's attempts to kill the babes at Bethlehem. Uh, the, the attempts at Nazareth, Nazareth to throw them off a cliff. The two storms at the sea in, in Mark 4 and Luke 8. I don't think were normal natural storms. These are fishermen that knew those waters that were terrified. And of course the ultimate strategy was the cross. And the summary of all of this is what we see in Revelation 12. But the real point is he's not through yet. He's still at it. You need to understand why and how he, go, how, how he operates. We get to Revelation 13. We have the two beasts introduced. The beast out of the sea is the first one. He's the political guy. Seven heads and ten horns. On his heads are the, with the name of blasphemy. He, he's, he's, he's taking up against God, as 2 Thessalonians 2 highlights for us. One of his heads, was de- he had a deadly wound, and that wound was healed. And uh, uh, I think it's a literal wound, by the way. I think that's the description that we'll come to in a minute. He's powered by the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. He's power- empowered by Satan for 42 months. And, uh, he over- and he overcomes the saints. Now that's a very strange thing. You find that in um, Daniel 8, and you'll find it here in Revelation 13, which is contrary to what Jesus said in Matthew 16 at, at Caesarea Philippi, when he told Peter that the gates of hell shall not prevail, overcome, same word by the way, overcome or prevail. Um, and so the, 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 my argument, these saints are not the church, and uh, they're post-church saints, as uh, scholars use the term tribulation saints. The earth dwellers worship the beast of the sea. And the, that is all those that are not written in the book of life. And then we have the second character shows up, the beast out of the earth. Also, elsewhere called the false prophet in the book of Revelation. He has two horns like a lamb. In other words, he has a, horns are a symbol of authority. Um, he speaks, he has authority of the lamb, uh, like the lamb, but he speaks as the dragon. He's, he has used Satan's words. 
He causes the earth to worship the first beast. So this is a duet. You've got a political leader, you've got a religious leader bringing people to worship him. He deceives the earth with miracles. The world is not ready for this. Are you ready to have a major satanic leader do miracles? Well, they're fake miracles. Not necessarily. Some may be. Doesn't matter. Everybody, they're, they're apparently very effective. He forces, he apparently has the power to force the worship of an image of the first beast. That's what's so parallel with the analogy with Nebuchadnezzar in, in, uh, in uh, Daniel chapter 3. Everyone that receives the mark in the right hands or the foreheads uh, uh, worship him. No man may buy or sell without the name or the number of the first beast. And of course that number is 666, which has of course uh, become very uh, fabled throughout literature. The, the, the 666. And then let's take a look. He causeth both the small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And I have a theory why it's a right hand and forehead I'll come to in a minute. And that no man may buy or sell save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. No, it's just his number or name, not yours. It's not your pin number. You may not be able to get a pin number unless you take his number, his, his in allegiance with him, but okay. And then verse 18 is the famous verse. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 600, three score, and six. And I think there's the only physical description we have in the Bible of the Antichrist is in Zechariah 11, verse 17. Woe to the idol, shepherd. It's I-D-O-L, shepherd. That leaveth a flock, the sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. It's my suspicion that he has a head wound, and it's, it's miraculously healed somehow, but he still has an incapacity from that. One, his right eye and arm, I believe, are darkened. So people who are pledging allegiance to him take his mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's a conjecture. But uh, it's intriguing that the Scripture is so interconnected on these things that I suspect that one, one reaffirms the other. The 666, of course, the word in Greek for Christos, is, uh, is, in Greek is Christos. The first and last letters of that uh, if you take, and there's this funny number in between. The the, uh, the the first letter it has a value in Greek of 600. The last letter has six, and the little one in between is 60. So it turns out that the gematry or the numeric numerics of the Greek also happen to be 666, which is kind of interesting. But again, I don't look at barcodes. Uh, there's all these interesting little things floating around that miss the point. The people who are taking, it's not something subterranean, it's something very conspicuous. They take, they deliberately pledge allegiance to him by taking his, his uh, name or number. And uh, the word uh, 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 in, in the Greek is antichristos, which is a, a pseudo-Christ. Not against Christ in the tense that opposite of Christ. He is, of course, but the word actually means in place of, a pseudo-Christ. But anyway, uh, a lot of people get into gamma tree, and let me just dismiss it by pointing out uh, there are numerical values for both Hebrew and Greek letters, interestingly enough, and people like to play with those. But it turns out if you get into this, you'll discover there's so many rules that you can actually make it say anything you want. There are all kinds of people have all kinds of strange conjectures. There's the expression in the computer industry that, that I think fits the situation. If you torture the data long enough, it'll confess to anything. And that's pretty much uh, true of mysticism in general and certainly gematria. But uh, let's move on. We've got the seven bowls of wrath in chapter 16. I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now this is the final wrath being poured out, literally poured out of these bowls. I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So we have the seven bowls of wrath. The first bowl is sores on the men with a mark. Okay. The second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. So we have the second bowl, the sea of blood, all died. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of the waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, which was, and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. 
For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are, for they are worthy. And heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judge, judgments. It's interesting, all through this, you never, been, you never make, hear anyone making the claim they're not just, not, just, not deserving. So we, anyway, we have the third bowl, which is the rivers and waters become blood. The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the power was given unto him to scorch men with fire, and then men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And so we have the fourth bowl, the sun scorched with fire. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and in their sores, and repented not of their deeds. So we have the fifth thing, which is darkness on the beast's kingdom. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. There it is again. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. That's kind of interesting. It's actually kings of the rising sun, but that's the tra traditional way of referring to the east, incidentally. So we have, anyway, the Euphrates and the kings of the east. Now this time we have a break, but the break is just a little brief one. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So we've got these three spirits like frogs. This may be just idioms like locusts on the one hand, but it's interesting to me that when you get into the UFO literature, that the heavy ones are these reptilian creatures. So I think there's a, that, that's kind of fascinating to me. That may be part of the previous bowl. Verse 15 of this sequence is, is, a, is really the parenthesis. It says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. That little praise is sort of a break, if you will. Then he, he gathered them together where? Into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Megiddo is the place. Har Megiddo is the Mount Megiddo. Armageddon is a Har Megiddo. It's, it's, the, it's the mount, the, the conspicuous mount there. If you've visited the area, it's an incredible place to visit. Anyway, so we have the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And, and why the air? Because who's the prince of the power of the air? Satan. Satan. See, first it was the beast's throne, now it's Satan himself. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. So that takes care of the bowls. Now, you, something kind of interesting, if you take the seven trumpet judgments we went through, you'll notice that there's a parallelism between the organization of the trumpet judgments and the bowls. The trumpet judgments are pretty, in a sense, they are like a one-third of the bowl kind of thing. They call these the judgments of the thirds. And uh, whether it's the burning on the ground or the sea of blood, rivers, so forth, it's, it's, it, the, the, judgments in the trumpet judgments seem to be very parallel to that, but one-third of the trees and grass, one-third of the sea, one-third of the waters made bitter, one-third of the sun, stars, and so forth, one-third of the men slain. There's something else you should be sensitive to, what I'll call the heptatic structure. We went through the seven seal scroll, and it had a, the, the chapter seven was the, you know, that was chapter six, chapter seven had the little parenthesis. The seventh seal, chapters eight and nine, led to seven trumpets, which also had an uh, interval between, you know, before the sixth and seventh, chapters 10 through 14 in this case. The seventh trumpet then breaks down into seven bowls. And it too had a little one verse parenthesis. But I think this design is deliberate. I think there's structure there. And there's much more to it than this. I'm just giving you the overview. Uh, there are, I challenge you to make a list of the sevens in the book of Revelation. Every time you think you've got them all, you'll find one more. And many of them are sort of hidden. Some are very obvious and some are hidden, the heptatic structure. Mount Megiddo, the site of, uh, of uh, Armageddon, of course, is about 60 miles north and slightly uh, west of Jerusalem. That's where Jabin and his 900 chariots were overwhelmed. That's where Gideon's 300 uh, defeated the Midianites and all that. That's where Samson triumphed, triumphed over the Philistines. And Barak and Deborah defeated Sisera that I mentioned before. Saul was slain by the Philistines there at Gilboa, uh, near there. Uh, Ahaziah was slain by arrows of Jehu. Pharaoh Necho slew King Josiah there. 
And throughout history, the Saracens, Christian Crusaders, Egyptians, Persians, Druze, Turks, Arabs, all through history, you'll discover this is a very favored battlefield. Napoleon had his disastrous march from Egypt to Syria there. So Megiddo has is, is become a, almost a fable or an idiom in literature. But don't let that confuse you. I believe there's a literal destiny at Megiddo. And uh, we have kings, this is all detailed for you in Daniel chapter 11, the kings of the south, the kings of the north. And then we have, the, by some people's rendering, the Antichrist being a western confederacy who's troubled when he hears tidings of the east. But I personally uh, suspect from Micah 5 and Isaiah 10 and some other passages that the Antichrist is not part of the Western, he's part of the Roman Empire, but he comes out of the Eastern part. So I believe he's associated somehow with the kings of the North coming in. But uh, that's a whole other study. We know the believing remnant in Jerusalem will seek refuge in Edom at Petra and then petition his return. And Jesus will return by rescuing the remnant. He comes back first in Edom before he comes to the Mount of Olives. It's all in Isaiah 63 and elsewhere. And then he will return to the Mount of Olives as Zechariah 14 uh, talks about him returning and so forth. Also chapter 17 and 18 has Mystery Babylon. We talked a little bit about that last time. The great whore. She rides the beast with seven heads and ten horns. She's described as the mother of harlots and abominations. She's drunk with the blood of the saints. Don't confuse her with the beast. She's the woman that rides the beast. There's a big difference. And uh, Babylon the Great is a city that ra raises over the kings. The kings, merchants, and those that trade by sea bemoan her catastrophic uh, demise. I think it's a literal city to, yet to arise to power. And uh, it's interesting to see the contrast of two women. The, Israel is the woman in chapter 12. Babylon is the woman in chapter 17. One is the, Israel's, uh, uh, the woman in Israel is in heaven. The one, other one's riding many waters. One is the mother of the man-child. The other is the mother of all harlots. One's clothed with the sun, the other one's clothed with purple, scarlet, and gold. The Israel's identity is with sun, moon, and stars because of the comments that Jacob made. Um, the woman riding the beast reigns over the kings of the earth literally and certainly has tried for, throughout the, uh, uh, the last 2,000 years. The enemy of the Israel was the dragon. The enemy of the woman riding the beast is the beast itself. The ten kings ultimately will devour her. And uh, Israel is hated by the world. The woman riding the beast is caressed by the world. The woman in uh, Israel is uh, uh, sustained by the wings of heaven. The other one is sustained by the dragon. It, it, it contrasts all the way through here. It's interesting that Israel is, is described in the Old Testament as widowed and divorced in Hosea and elsewhere. The woman riding the beast in, in, in uh, chapter 17 brags that she's not a widow. And I think the cut she delivers is drawing the contrast there. The final location of Israel, of course, uh, associated with the New Jerusalem, the final location of the woman riding the beast is the habitation of demons. So it's interesting to see that it's black and white, different contrast. The destruction of Babylon we've talked about before, that if you can contrast Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, they describe it as catastrophically uh, uh, being destroyed like it's never been through history. And many nations attacking and, and Israel's in the land forgiven, both describe it being destro destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, never again to be inhabited, bricks never to be reused. And that's why we attach such importance on the reemergence of Babylon in today's, in today's history. Uh, this, this destruction that's described is, occurs in the day of the Lord, which is yet future. And we're talking about a literal city on the banks of the Euphrates, not a symbolic rendering of Rome or Paris or New York or Hollywood or whatever. The king's fornication, drunk with wine, scarlet and purple, golden cup, all those idioms are common to Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the book of Revelation. So I think that we see the same thing in view here. These, this paradox is resolved. Is it, is it really an idiom of, of Rome or is it, is it something, uh, um, is it more literal? I think both are true. And I think it's resolved for us in Zechariah chapter 5, verses 5 through 11. There Zechariah sees a, 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 a ephah, which is a, like a, one, a big bushel merit measure. And in the ephah is confined a woman labeled wickedness. She's sealed in with a talent of lead. The ephah is the standard commercial volumetric measure in those days, and the lead was a, is the, uh, the measure of weight, about 97 pounds. This ephah then is carried by two women with wings of a stork. Now that's a strange idiom for a Jewish vision because the stork is an unclean bird. And uh, they carry it between earth and heaven. It's a vision, remember. They carry it 
to build it a house in the land of Shinar, and there it shall be established and set upon her own base. I believe the centroid of power that represented Babel under Nimrod, that becomes Babylon the Great, that then moves to Pergamus under the Persians and under Rome under the Romans, which is the fountain of all idolatry on the planet Earth, is, is uh, the Babylonian system packaged in either Latin or Greek or whatever. And uh, I believe it returns to where it started to receive the judgment of God. If that premise is correct, we'll see the literal city of Babylon reemerge. And uh, it's presently guarded by Marines. Trying to get there is foolish because it's very, very dangerous what's going on. Watch your news and see what happens over the coming year or two with Babylon. And I think it'll be very surprising to most people. It's, it's there, it's being rebuilt. So it has not been, it's never been destroyed in a way that fulfills the, the uh, biblical prophecies. Okay, so we have seven bowls of wrath. We finally have the seventh one. The seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of heaven and from the throne saying, It is done. And indeed it is. Okay. And then we have the fifth, what I call the fifth horseman, the horseman everyone overlooks. Not in chapter 6, chapter 19. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. This is the real one now. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Make war. In Numbers, we have the strange phrase that the Lord will go against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Yes, he has fought in the day of battle. In Joshua, the end of Joshua 5, I'll explain that to you. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. That's not his blood, it's the blood of his enemies. That's all described in Isaiah 63. And, uh, but we move on here. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth forth a sharp sword, that with it, should, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Who is this guy? Any doubt? <laughs> okay. This, now we get into the next topic, is the millennium. This is the strangest period of all periods in the, history, in the Bible. The thousand year reign. Verse chapter, this is all in Revelation chapter 20. I saw an angel come down from heaven having a key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Wow. This is the thousand-year reign. This is the thousand years that uh, Satan is bound. I take it literally. I don't think it's symbolic. I think it's real. It's not permanent. It's, he's going to be turned loose after a thousand years for, to deceive the nations one more time. So we ha it, the millennium is not out of Revelation 20 alone. It was promised to David in 2 Samuel and under oath in Psalm 89. It was predicted throughout the Old Testament in the Psalms in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Micah, Zechariah. It's a whole study in its own right. People associate the millennium with Revelation 20. That just mentions the exact duration. It was promised to Mary in Luke 1 verse 32. It's also in Micah 5 and Isaiah 9 and so forth that Jesus would rule on the earth. In the Lord's Prayer, you say, Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? And uh, so you, you're calling for it there. God, Jesus will rule. That's what Psalm 2 and Psalm 110 emphasize. That it be by a rod of iron, before whom every knee shall bow, and so forth. And uh, it, it, we're going to discover the creation will be changed. There'll be physical changes. Zechariah talks about it in Zechariah 4 and Isaiah 35. The curse of Genesis 3 will be lifted, according to Isaiah 11. And it's not just us, mankind, that's redeemed. The creation is redeemed. Romans 8, verse 20, 21, 22, make allusions to that. The, the, the creation which is subject to the bondage of decay until the, the redemption takes place. The earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord. That makes this a very strange time because after, with Satan bound, there is no excuse there's no shortages. There's no lack of knowledge about the Lord. And yet, given the chance, after that thousand years, man will once again rebel. And that's all she wrote. 
Yet millennium is not eternity. Don't confuse it with what comes after chapter 20. It's not eternity because death and sin are present. And each person there has land. And it will be fruitful. This is strange. This is different than what we'll find in chapter 20 uh, you know, uh, following. Let's talk about the order of events. You know, we talked about the seventh week of Daniel. We know that the first half of that week is a false peace with Israel for, as a result of this covenant. The last half is d- defined by none other than Jesus Christ is labeled as the Great Tribulation. Tribulation is three and a half years, not seven. And of course, the bat- it, it climaxes, the Tribulation climaxes with the Battle of Armageddon. The, we believe that rapture takes place prior to the 70th week. During that period of time in heaven, some things happen because Jesus brings us back to, en- to interrupt the battle of Armageddon and to establish his millennium, his kingdom. And uh, what happens up in heaven is the Bema seat and the marriage supper. There are three different judgment seats that get confused. The first one is the Bema seat, which is a allocation of rewards. It's a judgment seat like judges in an athletic contest. They don't punish them, they reward them. The bema seat of Christ, in the Greek it's the bema. It's the, the term is used, it's the same term is used in the, in the Olympics, etc., when you get your gold medal. That kind of, it's that kind of, that's where the faithful will get uh, recognition. That's also up there that the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. Satan is bound when Jesus comes back, as you read. Let's take a little, a little better look at the millennium here. We have Armageddon, Jesus comes back, the, the kingdom has started, Satan is bound. Right after that, or about that time, is there's the sheep and goat judgment, the judgment of the nations, and uh, how they treated Israel. That's Matthew 25, the sheep and goat judgment. It's a distinctive judgment. It's not the Bema seat. It's not the great white throne. It's a different thing. It's the beginning of the millennium. It's, it's the, those that survived, and the, 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 they get their judgment. Satan is bound for 1,000 years after which he is released. The 1,000-year period is defined by his being bound and his release. And uh, it's when he's released that he's wiped out and uh, the great white throne judgment takes place and this is the judgment of the unsaved dead and uh, uh, others. So the great white throne. And then we have a new heavens and a new earth and down from heaven we have the new Jerusalem. And that's the, what some people would call the eternal state. Don't confuse the period after the great white throne with the millennium because they're very different. And... Uh, but the, in fact, it's easier, to talk, it's easier to talk about the eternal state than the millennium has more mysteries about it. But the new heaven and the new earth, that's the final, uh, that's in chapter 21. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Wow. And there came unto me one of the seven angels which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked to me saying, Come hither, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. I have trouble trying to talk about this because I don't have any reason to believe it's only in three dimensions. We may have a hyperspace problem here. But anyway, it has 12 gates named with the 12 tribes. It's got 12 foundations named with 12 apostles. Those are different. And is it cubical? I don't know. It's 12,000 furlongs in each of three dimensions. 1,500 miles, I believe, is what it adds up to. That's a huge cube, if, some, if it's a cube. It has no temple because we're dwelling with God Himself. There's no night because the Lamb is the light thereof. The tree of life is there, and so the description is quite uh, uh, similar to Eden and so forth in some respects. Except instead of botanical things, it's, it speaks in terms of light. And the 12 stones are there categorized that are probably parallel with the 12 stones of the breastplate of the high priest. But it's hard to compare them because the idioms are very different in the ancient Hebrew versus the Greek and there have been attempts to to match them up but it's it's it's, it's a lot of speculation involved. Then we get to 22, which is really just an epilogue to the whole book. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates in the city. And it goes on much more. But finally, I said, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. 
And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, even so come Lord Jesus. And so ends the book.